Are target traces garbage or gospel? Some folks say it needs to be flat. Some want a huge bump in the low end. This is the subjective part of sound system design and tuning. All of us like our rigs to sound a little bit different. And so each of us may have a trace that we use on certain systems to make sure it's sounding great everywhere and sounding consistent. We have different speakers in a different room or we're on tour. This can be a guiding light for us that we can help align our systems to no matter what situation we are in. They can't make a bad rig sound amazing, but they can make a great rig sound incredible across every seat if you've done your homework beforehand. So today I wanna to walk you through the target traces that I use on every show and how I think about them and aligning my system too. I'm gonna to talk about why EQ should be the last tool that you use when making tonal balance decisions. It's a great one, but just needs to be put in the right spot. And then how to download the target traces that I use that are at the link below or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit and get them rolling in smart and open sound meter. Yeah, I'd I, I love for you to use those and follow along. So don't forget to get it at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit along with a lot of other great tools or at the link below. You can download those are a .txt files and can work in both smart and open sound meter. So let's jump right in. What are target traces and target curves there for? What do they help us do and achieve when we're tuning a sound system? So what they do is they serve as a quantitative data point that gives us a tonal balance that we can measure the current system we're working on and help match it to a predetermined ideal. This is not gospel. It's not going to turn a $200 budget speaker into a $20,000 sounding rig, but it is really helpful to give us some, some guardrails, a, a light post for us to look at and match our systems to. It can also be known as voicing APA. So this is a little bit more of the subjective part. Different system engineers and A1s are going to want different target traces for them to shoot for and align their system to. This is the same thing in headphone world. You know, people buy Dr. Dre beats because they want a bump and low end and a really crisp top end. But you got to go and spend five grand on a pair of Audi's headphones uh, that have a really flat neutral reference curve for, uh, for a system to align to. So everyone has different tastes and that's what makes audio so fun and so hard for it to align to. But what they do is just give us a standard to get our systems aligned. So what is our reference? What is flat? So let's define that real quick because this is a term that's, that's thrown around a little bit. I think folks understand. So flat is if I took a measurement in the field with a reference microphone that it's total balance is completely flat. And I got a transfer function curve that I ran along this zero line. So an open sound meter or smart, if I'm just flat, <laughs> you know, literally flat along that line of zero all the way across, that means my tonal balance is neutral. So I'm running pink noise through the system. I have the measurement microphone set up because pink is equal energy per octave. And in our audio analyzer software, it's going to use that same weighting and take it all the way across to zero. So if I had a perfectly flat speaker with a perfectly flat microphone in a room with no reflections, no variables, nothing like that, that's what I would get. So we're going to walk through these three target curves that I use here in a little bit, but we can, let's talk through these differences real quick. We have the high end below, and then it rolls up to a boosted low end and one, two of them taper off, and then one of them goes up, gives us a little bit of a bump down in the sub range. So we can see the systems that I tune and that I get them to are not flat. I would say they are neutral above 1K. I don't like a lot of variance above that, but I can say what feels good and has a good impact on my body and feels warm and just has a good amount of presence to it, but not too muddy. Uh, I found that these three curves, depending on which show I'm on, really give me a good place to start with my systems. Here's a quick caveat between the difference of target curve and target trace, because sometimes they're used a little bit interchangeably. A target curve is unique to smart. So if I go here, you can look at the manual a little bit more on page 104 of their V8 manual, 8.3 revision four. If I go into Smart and now go over to Spectrum, 
if I had a single channel, channel measurement of just a microphone out in the room and I played music and turned on a target curve, it'd be this floating couple of bars that would move around my signal. So I can have some load ups and target curves. I can use a cinema X curve. I can use the speech dialogue curve. I, I honestly don't use this feature at all when I'm in the field, so I'm not going to walk you through it here. But this is in the single channel mode versus a target trace. If I go to transfer function, is a dual channel measurement. So these are the th same three target curves that I've loaded up. And I made these by taking the EQ in Reaper and then running EQ version of the pink noise and the flat one it here into Smart. And I've captured these traces and aligned them to some predetermined curves. So this is a target trace. This is what you're gonna be looking at as you're taking measurements with your microphones in the field. And these serve as your guiding light. Uh, if you play a song or something through your system, you can pop over to Spectrum and have a target curve and make sure that the music is falling. Usually it'll have a bump in the low end and fall down to the top uh, and sounding right to your ears. So that's a target trace versus a target curve. How do you set your target traces up? So here in open sound meter, I uh, hit command I and I can import a trace. It's not going to take a trace data file like smart or a .trf file. It has to be in ASCII format. What that means is it can take a .txt or .csv file. So I have these three here. Uh, again, those are available at the link uh, below at or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. That gives you my entire toolkit and the target traces are in there. Just scroll a little bit and you'll find them. So if I want to import a new trace, I'll go here and I have my steady plus six, and I'll tell you why I call it that here in a little while, but that would be this new trace. And here it is now overlaid here, the orange one now. So that's how to import it in Open Sound Meter. It's pretty easy. Just got to know it's a .txt or .csv file. It could do a few others, but those are the ones that I use. If I am in smart, I would go to file, import, I can do a trace data file. So this is something that's already captured in Smart. That's the .trf. Uh, please fact, fact check me in that if I get that wrong. I'm usually working with the ASCII. I can do an entire folder, which is pretty cool. So it batch imports all that. Or I can import ASCII. So this is going to be looking for that .txt or .csv format, or those are two of the formats that I use. I can rename it, do trace. I keep these at the multi-time window and the sample rate that it was captured at. I capture all mine at 48, so that's what you'll use. You go browse, find the file, and let's now bring in our Festival Plus 12. Import, and here it is at the top. So I'll take this one away, and now we have that new trace, and I can move it around wherever and uh, align my measurements to that. So that's how to do that in Open Sound Meter and in Smart, how to import the traces. Uh, so make sure to download those and you can get going. What target traces do I use and why? So I've got three here. Let's step them one by one. So here is the steady plus six. I call it steady because it starts here at 1K and has a steady rise to 100 hertz and then it flattens out. This is very similar to the L Acoustics target curve. So I don't use L Acoustics rigs all the time. I, th I think the ones I've used sound great. Usually it's the Kara or Kara, however you want to say it. And this is what they what they have. So they have a window of tolerance above and below it. And they have from here all the way to 1K and start sloping up. The only difference is I like mine to taper off and stay flat at 100 down to the lowest frequency my subs can push because I don't like the low E on a bass guitar being, you know, 6 dB louder or 3 dB louder than the open G string. I want that to be neutral and even in my bass response. But that's just me. I'm not saying they got it wrong. That's just how I like systems. Again, this is the subjective tonal voicing every system part. So that's just me. But I'll just say it's very similar. You've probably seen this somewhere. And I use the plus six curve for my corporate gigs. I Because it's not this big giant rise. I want dialogue to be very clear. So it does not have to be this warmest, fattest, huge sounding thing in the world. So I'll do plus six. I might even go to only plus three. And I'm saying plus six because a plus six dB rise from the top end. So that plateau here I have at minus six. And it slopes up to zero. So that's a six decibel delta. You might say like, how come I don't have this uh, where my zero line is right here. Uh, and that's because I have to run the system hotter uh, to get that input up to that level where it's gonna match my reference signal that's looped back. So if I, I bring it down a little bit, I don't have to run it as hot. So that's why I move that there. 
I have the top end above that. So that's my corporate gig. It's a steady rise, 1K down on to 100 hertz. And here's the same thing, but now it's, it's a 9 dB rise from 1K down to 100 hertz. So this is uh, this one's actually the one most similar to the L Acoustics Curve. They, they've shown different charts with different rises, but it's almost always from 1K down to 100. Uh, and so this is, if I were just going to tune a system I've never heard before out the box, I, uh, I would get that up and usually align it to this curve for a music driven show. So if I mix in a band, this is where I'm going to start and get the rig there. Lastly, this is just a really common curve you're gonna see at music festivals and just big giant PA. So this is for EDM, this is for hip hop, it's for metal. It could be really for any genre, I think except for bluegrass or class, you know, orchestral music or something like that. But if I just want big, huge sounding pop music, this is a curve you will see often. I think other mix engineers and system engineers might hand off to you. So we can see the similarities is that this is almost exactly the same as the SETI plus six until we get to our subs right here. So you can go ahead and just voice the system to steady plus six while you're working on your mains. Then as you fold in your subs, you just gotta know that you gotta have six dB, six dB more power in your subs versus your mains to meet this target curve. So uh, that may be a good starting point. Uh, if you don't know what the engineer's gonna have is do the steady plus six, or if you want one where the low end subs aren't really punching out and above the rest of the system as much, you can go do Steady Plus 9. So those are just the three that I use on the shows that I enjoy, and you can download those and start to align your system to them. So how would I get my system to align to this target curve? What are some of those principles? So I need to design a system capable of producing these results. So I, I cannot just go up to a front fill on the stage, solo it, put my mic in front of it, and then EQ it to this target curve. It's not gonna be able to push this low end, right? And so I need to know its job within the system. And front fill's job is to bring down the aural localization down to the stage, because usually arrays are hung really high in the air. So they're gonna help me bring it down. So I'm really gonna focus on the top end energy and make sure here from 1K on up is sounding good and I, I'm not really going to worry about the sub or the, the front fill pushing much below about 200 hertz because the, the, the mains are going to leak in there, right? And so I need to make sure uh, and have my whole system in mind before I really zoom in on EQing any particular subsystem. So that's mains versus side fills, mains versus delays, mains versus front fills, and any combination in between. I need to know the physical limits of the speaker. So a front fill is not gonna be capable of producing the low end of the big main hang, right? So just know that, okay, I'm not gonna ask it to produce more. Also, uh, know your subs limits. So this target curve uh, is pretty flat from 63 to 31. So I know that a QSC KW181 sub is not capable of getting down to 31. Not, not in a million years. It's a single 18, it's a fantastic sub. It can get to 40 pretty well, but once you nosedive below that, it's not gonna do it. So I'm not gonna expect that out of my sub to get to 31. I cannot EQ it into submission without destroying a driver. So I'm not, or I have it just limiting the whole time. So you cannot simply hammer a speaker into doing something at camp. So you also need to know what variables are already in play. So we talked about the speaker itself. The, the speaker's interaction with other speakers, and that's usually lows and low mids spilling into other zones. We wanna make sure there's clarity, so a speaker pointed at a zone is gonna improve clarity because we have high frequencies there. We also need to know the distance to the audience, so the farther away something is, the, the more high-end roll-off we're gonna have versus the, the, the low-end. And we need to know about the room acoustics. So there's room modes, so if I have a mic position in the front row, middle, and the back, and there's huge variances in the low-end, that's probably because of room modes, so the, the way that the sound waves are bouncing off the walls in these patterns that have cancellation and summation. And there's also just plain old reflection, so sound bouncing off a wall and coming to a certain point later in time and giving us comb filtering. So we, we will always have to work against those unless we are mixing in an anechoic chamber or outside where we have much fewer reflections, but those are already variables that we need to worry about and have thought through before we just start EQing our system to align to this curve. So make sure we have our selection aiming, our level setting, our phase alignment all come first, then you can start to EQ a speaker. So we're making sure it is aligning to this with EQ. So all EQ is is selective frequency, frequency dependent level adjustment. So we do our broad level first, then jump to that. 
You can make case that phase alignment could technically come after uh, EQ because EQ is going to affect phase unless you're using fancy FIR filters, depending on the depending on the, which one you're using. But we can talk more about that in a later video. So your zone EQ for a particular system may look different uh, versus on a particular part of the system versus the whole. So we talked a little bit earlier about how a main system is going to have a low end that spills other places, depending on the line length and a couple of other variables. But my side hangs, uh, I might be prone to take out some low end because so much of it is going to be spilling from the mains into the sides. So we can't just go to an individual zone, solo it, EQ to the curve, move on. We have to think about the entire system. So that's mains to front fills, mains to side fills, mains to the delays. Um, so I'm going to hammer that point home because it's, it's very easy just to view each part of your system uh, in isolation. You need to think about the conglomerate rig all working together. So where do I place my measurement microphones when I'm aligning my system to a target curve? Um, uh, we're going to place it in between subsystems when we are time aligning and making sure they're all working together. But for getting the tonal balance of system, we're going to place it on axis. So it's basically in the center of the speaker's throw. And I usually place, uh, if I don't have time to really spend a really granular amount of time, like on the install, but we're going to show and like we got to get going, my default is going to be center of the uh, main left throw on the front row, put one in the middle of the audience and in the back row. If I have like a crazy long audience or I'm in an arena, it can't be that easy. But for most shows, that's going to be the case. And so I'm looking and seeing, okay, if it's a single speaker, the EQ moves I make are going to affect every position. It's not like I have a line array where I can do EQ separately on each of the boxes or each of the zones. So that's going to change a little bit too. So you have to know uh, how it, are my EQ moves affecting the whole. So that's why I like having it on axis with the speaker's throw, but in the front, in the middle, and back. So what I'm going to do is uh, in Smart, I can actually call up an average and have my A, B, C microphones all averaging together. And what EQ moves can I do to make the average snap to that target curve that I'm working for. I'll work on mains first and then turn on subs and fold those in. Then also look at phase alignment because the phase, or the overlap between the mains and subs and their alignment is going to affect the magnitude or, or how strong that low end is. And so I will do my mains to sub alignment before I finish my tonal balancing. And I got some videos coming on mains to sub alignment because folks have been asking. So thank you for being patient. Those are coming. What other resources are helpful for us besides target traces when aligning our What other resources are helpful for us when we're tuning our systems to a target trace? Like I said, we want to eliminate as many variables or at least know how they're affecting our systems as a whole. And a great way to do that is to know what the speaker you're working with sounds like in the near field when you're close to it. Data gets really hazy when you get really far away from the speaker because there's reflections and room sound and all that. So this resource is tracebook.org. If you don't know about it, it's started by Nathan Lively. And engineers can log in and upload measurements of speakers that they've taken in the near field. So here is a RCF HDL 6A. I use this speaker all the time. And real tiny here is the measurement microphone on the floor. And it's about 8.76 feet away. And they took a measurement and we can look at really great coherent data. We see this coherency line, it's, it's, it's fantastic. And, and we can see what this single speaker is going to look like and see its phase trace as well. So this is fantastic. And I can go here to TF native download it, and this is the .trf file that will work in Smart. So if I go back over here, file, import, trace data file, and I found that here, and here's that RCF box, and I can now see compared against my target traces, what that speaker looks like, and I can also see the phase data. So I'm not trying to manhandle a single box and look like this, but I usually have these arrayed. And if I get significantly different traces in the field than what this is showing me here, accounting for how the array goes together, I'm in trouble. So this is just a great tool to have to serve as another guidepost as you're taking measurements because there's so many variables can pop up in the field. Here's a few caveats. What I haven't talked about yet are reference tracks. So what do you do after you've aligned your systems to a target curve is put on your favorite reference track. I love to use Phoenix by Andrew Holmes. I think Get Lucky by Daft Punk 
and Vultures by, by John Mayer are all three fantastic tunes that I just know really well. So I'll put all three of those on, usually do a chorus of each, walk the room and see if it's all translating. Is all my timing done right? Is, is the tonal balance between all my systems? If I move front to back in a room, does it sound good? So I know these tracks like the back of my hand. I know the kick is supposed to hit me a certain way on Phoenix. I need the impact of that kick versus the snare to feel right. So the center of that kick hits at 45 hertz and the snare hits at 150. So that helps me determine is my mains to sub handoff sounding right. So all these reference tracks give me clues and, and, and give me a gut check for this tonal balance curve. So then I'm doing fine fine-tuned adjustments across the whole rig to make sure that reference track is there. Because again, a, a target trace is not gospel, but is incredibly helpful quantitative data, especially when I have more variables I'm used to working with, a new room, a new rig. So that's, that's the caveat there. Lastly, make sure that EQ is the last tool that you're using to align your system. Most people think sound system tuning is just slapping on an EQ across the rig, putting the microphone somewhere and twisting until you get it flat. That is not the case. Make sure you have done your homework first, selected the right speaker in the right spot, pointed the right direction, aligned everything, level set, then EQ to your target trace. I, what I would love to hear from you is where are the target traces that you are using? Uh, how, can you download the three of mine and, and compare them? What are the differences that are you seeing? Uh, do you like it flat? Do you like a bigger LF bump? Are you an EDM festival guru and really know that they want 18 dB above on the subs versus the other? I would love for you to comment below. Let me know. Again, you can get my target traces at the link below or at producedbymkc.com slash audio toolkit. My name is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for watching and I will catch you next time.